Ready, Miss Joanne? Miss Joanne, you about ready? 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 All right, good evening. Good stand with me, or good afternoon, I guess it would be. Page 543, when the roll is called up yonder, we'll do all three verses of page 543. 543. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. Oh, when the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Oh, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, oh, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and <coughs> ask him to bless our evening afternoon service today. Brian, would you pray for us, Brian Smith? Amen. All right, you can be seated. And, uh, well, we had a good lunch, and, and so I know that everyone is full. So, Brother Ken, good song choice, singing about roles, and uh, <laughs> different role, though, and not a buttered roll, yeast roll, or anything like that, but a role in heaven. I hope your name is Zone. Amen. Uh, a couple of announcements. If you brought, brought food for uh, the meal, then make sure you uh, go back to the... Uh, Jim, before you leave and get whatever dish you brought your food in, and uh, please don't leave those, uh, get, get those and bring those home. We are grateful to each of you that did bring and contributed to the meal. It was excellent. Everything was really good. Uh, thank you to Miss Wanda and all of the rest of the help, Bobby and Joanne and others that stayed back there and helped uh, prepare it, put it out for us, and then stayed after and cleaned it up, and are cleaning it up, I should say, and uh, so we appreciate that. And uh, you see them, you let them know you're grateful for that. We've got a thank you card here that uh, I meant to read this morning. It slipped my mind. It said, uh, the outside says, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work, wishing you blessings as generous as your heart, as encouraging as your thoughtfulness, and as appreciated as your kindness. And it says to Pastor Wesley and Parkwood Baptist Church, Thank you so much for letting us stay here at the church. So thankful for the RV hookups. We appreciate all you and the church did for us while, uh, while here. You are a blessing. Because of your generosity, 12 souls came to know the Lord and three rededicated their lives to the Lord. To God be the glory. Love, Rick and Nancy Montez, your Mercy Project missionaries. 
And then there's about one, two, three, there's five or six, maybe more personal notes here as well. The, uh, a group of teenagers from a church in Pennsylvania uh, flew down to help out with that vacation Bible school that Brother Rick and, and uh, the Gospel Preachers Association put on, and they were able to use our upper room uh, for the few days that they were here, and so each of those teenagers wrote a little note in here as well. So if you want to see that, it'll be up here. Uh, but uh, Brother Rick and Miss Nancy thought they'd be with us today, but because of uh, Hurricane Ida, they left yesterday to try to get through the state of Louisiana and as far east as they could uh, before that hit. And so speaking of, that hurricane should be making landfall any time now if it hasn't already. And so we really need to pray for pray for uh, those that are in its path. That's going to be a devastating storm. And so let's continue to pray for them. And, and uh, I'll certainly be in contact with a couple of pastors I know in New Orleans and the, the uh, areas around there. And we'll see how we can help out. And uh, many of those pastors came to our, our, uh, our need during Hurricane Harvey and sent thousands of dollars and workers and project, uh, food and different things uh, through, through our church to be able to help those in need. And so we certainly want to do, do our part as well. And so I'm sure by Wednesday night we'll be able to announce something uh, where, where we can send some money and uh, hopefully help those that, that will have need. So let's pray for them. Uh, remember that. Uh, remember Wednesday night we will have a meal as well at 545 uh, and our service will just continue to stay in the gym. And so if you would like to be here from five, anytime from 545 to 630 on Wednesday and uh, eat supper, then certainly we would invite you to do that. Remember on Saturday... Uh, this coming Saturday, September the 4th, uh, we've got a men's uh, prayer meeting, uh, men's prayer breakfast at 8 a.m. Uh, trust that you'll be here for that. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. If you plan on attending, write your name down. If you have invited someone and uh, you think they're going to come with you, then make sure you note that as well uh, so we know how much food to buy this week. And uh, Brother Larry Lafanier, Glory Baptist Church in Stafford, Texas, will be preaching to us uh, that morning. And so keep that in mind. Uh, September the 14th is the ladies, your, your monthly Bible study is starting back up uh, from the summer break. And uh, the first one is September the 14th. That will be at mine and Lori's home, 6.30 p.m. That's a Tuesday. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back if you'd like a copy of the book. Uh, you ladies will be going through the Bible study by Ann Graham Lotz entitled Jesus in Me. If you'd like a copy of that, sign up. And we'll get you a copy, and uh, that will be handed out during that first meeting. And so it won't cost you anything. Those have been taken care of. And so uh, that's a blessing. We appreciate that. And trust that you ladies will have a good, a good Bible study over the next eight, uh, eight months, eight sessions. All right. I don't think I'm forgetting any announcements. It is good to have, once again, Brother Chet Furrow, our missionary in Russia, and uh, his wife, uh, Luba and their their boys, uh, their two oldest ones are in the service this afternoon. They weren't in the morning. They were in children's church, and uh, but we're glad to have both of them. And uh, certainly, always good to see them. Good to see our missionaries. Good to see uh, Brother Lamar Ard and his wife uh, uh, sitting back in the uh, towards the back of the church. Brother Lamar's pastored Cornerstone Baptist Church in Missouri City, I believe. For how long, brother? Twenty four years. Twenty four years, and. Uh, uh, the church is going through a transition as well, much like uh, this church did when, when Brother Mark went into evangelism and you voted me in as pastor. New pastor is uh, uh, taking up the mantle where Brother Lamar is, is, uh, is he's still staying in the church and going to be a member there at the church, but he thought it would be good to give that pastor uh, a little room this morning, and, uh, and so he visited with us, and we're grateful for that, and uh, Brother Mark thrift has preached for brother lamar on multiple occasions and he he's very familiar with our church so we're glad to have them here this they were here this morning and this afternoon god bless you thank you for being here and joining us all right we don't have any uh musical specials tonight or this afternoon but uh, a little while back a couple maybe a month ago something like that miss Juanita came to me approached me and asked me if uh she could share uh, something to the church something that she had heard or read, and I read over it, and it's, uh, it was good, bless me. I think it was written, who wrote that, Miss Juanita? Uh, Don Wildman. Don Wildman. I went to Israel with Tim Wildman 
in uh, 2014. Don's over, works for the AFA, American Family Association. I'm sure you hear him on the radio. And uh, so, Miss Juanita, you come now, and she wanted to share this with the church, and I thought it, thought it was good when I read it. What I'm going to read is called, What Christians Do Now. In 1973, the, the Supreme Court said it was okay to kill unborn babies. Since then, we have killed more than the entire population of Canada. And it continues, a woman's choice. Half of those who have died in their mother's wombs have been females. They didn't have a choice. It is called abortion. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. First it was in dingy, dirty theaters, then convenience stores, then grocery stores, then on television. Now it is in the homes of millions via the internet. It is called pornography. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. They call it no fault. Why should we blame anyone when something so tragic happens? Haven't they already suffered enough? Half of the marriages in America end this way. The children suffered. The family broke down. It is called divorce. Me, I go to church. The minister preaches. I go home. That's what Christians do now. At one time, it was a perversion. We kept it secret. We secured help and hope for those who practiced it. Now it is praised. We have parades celebrating it, and elected officials give it their blessing. Now it is endowed with special privileges protected by special laws. Even some Christian leaders' denominations praised it. It is called homosexuality. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. It used to be an embarrassment, a shame. Now a third of all births are to mothers who aren't married. Two-thirds of all African-American children are born into a home without a father. The state usually pays a tab. That is why we pay our taxes, so that the government can take place of parents. After all, government bureaucrats know much better how to raise children than parents do. It is called illegitimacy. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. At one time it was wrong, but then the state decided to legalize it, promote it, and tax it. It has ripped apart families, destroyed lives, but just look at all the money the state has raised. No longer do we have to teach our children to study, work hard. Now we teach them they can get something for nothing. We spend millions encouraging people to join the fun and excitement. Just look at the big sums that people are winning. They will never have to work again. It is called gambling. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. Long ago, Christians were the good guys, but now any positive image of Christians in movies or on TV is gone. We are now de depicted as the bad guys, greedy, narrow-minded hypocrites. The preacher can't have a Bible on his desk, but he can have an issue of Playboy. We don't have Christian, we don't have Christmas and Easter holidays, just winter break and spring break. We can't pray in school, but can use foul language. It is being tolerant. Me, I go to church, the minister preaches, I go home. That's what Christians do now. Yes, all these things came to pass within 30 years. Where were the Christians? Why they were in church? All these things are 
for someone else to deal with. Times have changed. Involvement has been replaced with apathy. But don't blame me. I didn't do anything. I go to church. The minister preaches. I go home. That's what Christians do now. All right. Thank you, Miss Juanita. We appreciate you sharing that the church and how true it is, how sad it is, how far the tide has shifted in a lot of ways, and yet the church hasn't been the salt and light that it needs to be, that it's been called to be. And so God have mercy on us and our country, and uh, certainly a lot of truth in what she wrote and what she read. So thank you, Miss Juanita, for sharing that with us. Galatians chapter number 3. And certainly, it goes right along with the book of Jude, what we're studying on Sunday mornings. But I do invite you to open your Bible to Galatians chapter 3 for our evening service, and, and uh, we'll be mindful of the time and mindful that everybody has a full belly now. So keep those things in mind. I took a test this week that tries to help reveal the, what they call the ideal man. And uh, it had a number of different categories that men could be placed in. And I am I'm just thrilled to report to you that the category that your pastor was placed in was entitled awesome. And uh, it's true, I am in the awesome category. Here was the description of an awesome man according to this test. The awesome man is in his late 20s. He's about 6 foot 1, 210 pounds. He's got two boys and a beautiful wife. He lives in the suburbs. He enjoys sports. He loves golf. He loves to read. He's a morning person. His personality type, little to none. His hair, losing it. His love for soccer, never had any. Sorry, fellas, I'm, I'm sorry. Favorite color? I'm just reporting the facts here. Ole Miss Red and Blue. And after I typed in my information based on that description, it said you're in the awesome category. Now, I know what the real question is, is who wrote the test? The answer, I did. I wrote the test. And then I measured myself against it, and I came out as awesome. You say that's ridiculous. I agree. It is ridiculous. But you know what? It's exactly what a legalist does. Exactly. We've been studying... Grace versus legalism in the book of Galatians for almost three months now. A legalist is someone who writes their own standard of how to measure up, how to be good enough for God, what must be done for them to be forgiven, the things they must do to go to heaven. And then they measure themselves against their own standard and they conclude, spiritually speaking, I'm awesome. Yet I would suggest to you that if every legalist would measure themselves not against their own man-made, homemade standard, but against measure themselves against the actual standard of God, which, by the way, is perfection, that he or she would have no other choice than to leave legalism and flee the grace of God. If you've been here over the past 10, 11 weeks, then you know this, but let me give a quick review uh, for those that haven't. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is fighting legalism. And he tells us that the root of the gospel is the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace, we defined as God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved kindness that he gives to lost sinners who deserve his wrath. And so grace is getting everything that God has to offer absolutely free. It is the root of the gospel, but the fruit of the gospel is the peace of God. And when you grasp the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ, what that produces in your life is peace. And the peace that Paul is talking about is peace with God. You are right with God because you have totally and you have eternally 
uh, been forgiven of all of your sin, past, present, and future, and there is nothing that can change your standing with God if you're saved. You have been washed clean uh, now and forevermore. You will never experience the pain and the penalty for your sin because Christ did that for you on your behalf on the cross. You have peace with God. Grace is the root of the gospel. Peace is the fruit of the gospel. But legalism is the enemy of the gospel. As I stated, legalism, or religion if you will, is thinking that somehow, some way, I can earn or I can merit God's love, His acceptance, His forgiveness by my performance, by my efforts in life. In other words, if I do this and I do that, if I don't do this, I don't do that, if I do good, if I try hard, then somehow, some way, God will be pleased with me, He will accept me, He will love me, He will forgive me, but all of this must happen, for this to happen, I've got to do my part. Well, Paul is battling that. He is battling legalism in this letter to the Galatian churches. And in the first two chapters, he battles the corruption of the plan of salvation. There were some who, were, who came along after Paul had left these Galatian churches. And you'll recall we put the map on the screen and showed you where he had been. And, and uh, they came along after and they tried to add some sort of work or some sort of religious activity to the gospel, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Paul says again and again, it just doesn't work. You cannot mix any works with grace because when you mix works with grace, it ceases to be grace. You cannot add, you cannot subtract anything to the gospel or from the gospel. And uh, when that takes place, it becomes a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. But starting in the last part of chapter number 2 and into chapter number 3, it's really a running discussion about those who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior by faith. And uh, he's approaching Christians uh, that might have been tempted or might have even started to slide back into works. They were beginning to slide back into a performance-based system where they thought they needed more religion, more good deeds, more religious stuff to somehow merit more favor, more acceptance, more righteousness with God. And so Paul is writing uh, for, that, for that reason. Last week we got to uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse number 14 and you'll recall that's where Paul reminded them that God has always saved people by faith and faith alone. He gave us the illustration of Abraham and where God had made a promise to Abraham. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to be your God and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. This is my promise to you. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God. And, and uh, at that point, God put some uh, credited to his account, Abraham's account, righteousness. He is righteousness. Abraham didn't do religious things. He didn't read religious books. He didn't perform religious ceremonies, and then God fulfilled the promise. He didn't obey the law, and then God saved him and blessed him. Uh, friend, the law didn't come for 430 years after Abraham. No, God saved Abraham, and God blessed Abraham when he simply believed God by faith. And the Bible says at that moment, God uh, credited his account with righteousness. So Paul is writing, he's using that as an example, as an illustration, and he's saying that this promise not only applies to Abraham, but it applies to anyone who will trust God by faith. And so we become children of Abraham, not becoming, uh, by becoming a Jew, not by adhering to the law, but by trusting in Jesus Christ. We'll pick up in verse number 15 where we left off with that theme and line of thought. Notice what Paul says. He says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant, that was confirmed before of God in Christ, 
the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. Verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. It's almost like Paul can hear the Judaizers say, but if the law came after the faith of Abraham, then the law must supersede faith. And Paul says no. And he uses a human illustration to clarify his point. If someone enters into a covenant agreement, it's a permanent thing. In the Greek language, it would refer to a covenant as a, almost like something like a will. Someone writes up his or her will, uh, that is a legal document. It's, it's, it's uh, legally ratified, and nobody can come along afterward and change it. I, for instance, I have a, a will. Lori and I had a will made uh, uh, a few years back, and uh, when I'm dead and gone, none of you will be able to come up and say, you know, I don't like what he did there. I don't like how he worded that. I don't like what he left uh, his boys or left to his wife, I think I'll change that. That's legally binding. You can't do that. Uh, even my son, who's three years old, understands uh, uh, a covenant or a promise. I'll give you an example. A few weeks back, Lord, you'll recall this. Uh, Avid was in bed. Maddox was needing to go to bed. He was fighting it. We were in the boys' playroom, and Maddox has a little tykes basketball goal. And uh, Lori's trying to get him to go to bed. I'm trying to get him to go to bed. And he's just, he said, can I play a few more minutes, a few more minutes? Well, I have a hard time telling my son he cannot play a sport when he's asking me to play a sport. And uh, so here's what I did. I said, Maddox, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you one more shot. You got to shoot where I tell you to shoot from. And if you make this shot and you go to bed after you make this shot, Daddy, we'll go to the store and buy you a toy tomorrow. I made him the promise. But I thought there's no way in the world Brother Bobby's going to make this shot. He's 10, 15 feet away from the, the goal. I didn't think he could throw the ball that far. And wouldn't you know it, he throws it, didn't touch the backboard at all. Somehow it bounced off the wall, off another toy, and went in the basket. I thought, man, he couldn't do that again in 100 tries if he tried. Uh, yeah. it just, you know, the Lord was laughing at me. Well, he went to bed. He minded. He went to bed, went to sleep after that shot. The next day, first thing he reminded me of was, Daddy, we need to go to the store and get my toy. I said, son, we will, just not right now. And here was his response, but you promised. But you promised. Even kids get the power of a promise. And so Paul is saying, if that's true from a human perspective, how much more true is it coming from God? Friend, once God has made a promise, uh, He will not come along years later and change it. God entered into a covenant agreement with Abraham, and that covenant agreement was based upon His Word. It was based upon a promise. And the promise was, if you believe my faith, you enter into the inheritance of God. Uh, you're saved. You enter into eternal life. So Paul writes to the church of Galatia and he, he's reminding uh, in his argument that the promise of God was to Abraham and his seed. And he specified that it's not seeds, it's seed. It's singular referring to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the promise of God. Therefore, everyone who believes uh, by faith in Christ, uh, uh, then at that point they are in Christ. They receive the promise that God promised to Abraham. And, and so no, you don't have to go through religious ceremonies. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to adhere to all the Old Testament requirements. Uh, friend, you are a recipient of the promise if you're saved because you are in Christ. And so Paul says the law came 430 years later. But it does not have the power to invalidate the promise. That's what he said. The promise is one of faith. If you trust Christ by faith, you're in Christ. And you receive the promise of eternal salvation and eternal life. The, eternal life. And the law cannot come afterwards and say, no, it's not by faith, it's not by works. It's not by faith, it is by works. You, you just can't believe God for eternal life. You've got to do something for it. Paul says it doesn't work that way. That's not possible. Just like a man can't do that with his will or a, or a, a covenant, neither can God. God made his promise. 
God made his covenant and it's binding and no one will change that. And so with that line of thinking raises a good question, a logical question. What is the purpose of the law then? Why have it? Why did God give it to us 430 years later? And that's a good question. Well, notice Paul's going to deal with that in verse 19. He says, wherefore then serveth the law? To put this in language we would understand, what is the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So why the law? He says it's because of transgressions. The word transgressions is not just another word for sin. It's a very technical term. It literally means to violate the law. So in order to know they're violating the law of God, there has to be a law, and humans need to know the law. So God gave the law. The law is a standard of living, and it helps people see where they're falling short. You see, before the law, people were sinning against God and perhaps sometimes didn't even know it because they didn't have the law yet. And so the logic of Paul's argument goes something like this. God made a promise, a promise of salvation that couldn't be received only by faith. But we as people have a ten tendency to think, I can do it myself. If it's going to be, it's up to me. I can try hard, I can work hard, I can do good, I can make myself good in God's sight. And we do this by setting up standards, but they're artificial standards. Religion is full of that, my friend. Legalism is full of that. And as long as you do these activities, you go to these meetings, you jump through these hoops, then you're good and God will somehow be pleased with you or we compare ourselves with someone else. And you'll hear this all the time. I'm just as good as him, just as good as her. Or if anyone's getting to heaven, it's got to be me. So we make our own man-made standards and then we measure ourselves like the test I gave myself. And after I measure myself on my own test, I conclude I'm awesome, I'm okay. But as long as we're in that frame of mind, we don't have a need of a Savior. We have no need of a Savior. So God brought forth the law 430 years later, helping people realize that they aren't good. Actually, in all reality, we're really, really bad. Through the law of God, God reveals His standard and helps everyone, everybody realize that there's no way that any of us can measure up. We're not awesome and without help, we have no hope. We won't make it. And so the law does just that. It exposes our need for a Savior. And in verse number 19, it says the law came to man through the process of mediation. In other words, God gave it to the angels, who gave it to Moses, who gave it to the people. And the whole system is a two-party system. A holy God and a sinful people. And so God lays out the standard. If you obey it, you'll be blessed. If you disobey it, you're under judgment. But the people constantly realized was that they could not keep the standard. They weren't measuring up. They were falling short. They weren't even coming close. And so there was this constant mediation, which was the whole temple and the whole sacrificial system. And all of that was necessary because they were constantly realizing that I'm a failure, that I'm, I'm not perfect, that I can't be perfect, that I'm not righteous, that I can't keep the standard, and I'm in real trouble. And the text says that that was necessary until what? The seed. The seed. Until Christ came to fulfill the promise. And so it was a temporary picture of what was to come in the future. Now verse number 20 is an interesting verse. For your information, it's got about 250 different interpretations. So we'll just go through each one of those right now. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll tell you what I think it means. Verse number 20. Let's read it first. Galatians 3.20 says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Here's my interpretation. In the Old Testament, they had a rather strange way of making a covenant with each other. 
when two people wanted to make a serious agreement with one another, they would take an animal, kill it, they would split it in two. And they would put half of it on the left and half of it on the right. And then they would pass through the two parties and they would say something like this. If I don't keep this deal that we're making, then what happened to this animal, let it happen to me. The other person would do the same. Jot down in your notes Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis 15 is where we have the covenant agreement between Abraham, between God and Abraham. It's in Genesis 15, 17, and 18. Verses 17 and 18. If you'll read it when you get home, you'll find that there's something missing in those two verses. You've got God passing through the pieces, but you don't have Abraham passing through the pieces. What was happening? God was saying something like this. Abraham... I'm making a covenant with you, but I'm taking all the responsibility. If you or I break this covenant, then let it be done to me what's done to this animal. Did God break the covenant? Absolutely not. Does Abraham and his descendants break the covenant? Absolutely. Absolutely. Who dies on their behalf? God does. God does. Verse 20 says that usually it's a two-party agreement. Both have to fulfill the demands of the covenant, but not in that one. God is one, and God bears the full responsibility of that covenant. Thank God. If it was up to you and if it was up to me, we'd be in real trouble. Real trouble. But verse 21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could, have been, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Friend, the law wasn't bad. Don't think the law was bad. The law reflects the perfect character of God. And he's saying if someone could have kept the law perfectly, it would have led to life. But the point of the law is nobody can. No one comes even close. And notice in verse 22, But the scripture hath concluded all are under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That terminology there where it says the scripture hath concluded all under sin, it, it, it literally means in the Greek, uh, it means to be put into prison. The scripture has put into prison those controlled by sin. And so the law comes along and provides the standard of living that God requires, that he wants and it's easy to realize no one can live up to it. We're all guilty before a righteous God, a holy God. You're locked up in the prison of sin. You have no hope in and of yourself. And there's not, no amount of good whatsoever that can make the bad go away. But then comes Jesus. And he visits you in prison. And he says, you know what? I've got a get out of jail card and it is free. I paid your debt for your sin. I, I now offer you freedom from the prison of sin. I give it to you freely, and you receive it by trusting in me by faith. That's exactly what Paul's saying. He gets to verse 23 through verse 28, verse 29, and he's going to talk about once that takes place, once, once a man has given his heart to Christ, there are some things that that man receives five new things that every person gets when they are freed from the prison of sin by placing their faith their hope in the gospel are you ready for these new things i like new things don't you the first new thing and i promise i won't be low the first new thing God gives every Christian when they place their faith in Christ, number one, is a new freedom. Notice what he says in verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Verse 24, wherefore the law is, was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come and we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Paul says before this faith came in Christ, we were in custody by the law. We were well guarded in the prison of sin. And who were the guards of, a, of the prison of our own making? Shame and, and guilt and despair and 
hopelessness and condemnation. Uh, these guards were actually necessary to get you to a point where you realize that you had a real need for a Savior to be rescued. The law wasn't bad, it's good. It helped you realize that you were condemned. Uh, you can't do it on your own, you need help. And so you were kept in this prison. You were guarded by those until faith in Christ came along. And when we finally admit we cannot save ourselves, and we reach out in simple faith to Jesus Christ, the prison doors swing wide open. You're saved. You're liberated. You have freedom. And at that moment, we come to Christ for salvation. God declares us righteous. He wipes away the record of our guilty disobedience. And our record may be clear. And our conscience ought to be clean. And that means the law cannot keep you in the prison of sin any longer. It, the law that condemned you now has no power over you. You are set free from the trap of trying to please God by outward behavior. That is true freedom. And it only comes to those who trust in Christ. Now, we struggle with this. Our culture struggles with this. If we really embrace the theology of grace and the fullness of freedom... We struggle with this. We think somehow things are going to spin out of control and, and things like that. But friend, that's why the Holy Spirit's placed within your heart. To guide you, to walk with you, to lead you. And, and uh, the Bible is very clear. Friend, the law doesn't have the power to make you righteous. The law uses external pressure to conform you to the standard of God. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make you right. It doesn't make you saved. It couldn't help you. And yet you place your faith in Christ. You're born again, you're saved, you're free from the prison of sin. You're given the spirit of the living God to help you live for God in this freedom. So you have a new freedom. Number two, every believer gets a new identity. Notice in verse 26, he says, For you all are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now that is an astounding statement. It's a mind-blowing statement. Paul boldly declares that everybody who believes in Christ is a son or a daughter of the living God. Our identity has been radically changed. Once we were the devil's children uh, because we were of the first Adam, but by faith in the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been transferred into a brand new family, the family of God. And if you believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, you're His child. For now and then I'll read or I'll hear of, of uh, someone or some group pushing the universal fatherhood of God, the universal brotherhood of man idea. And they'll say something like this, we're all children of God, but we're not. We're all creations of God, I'll give you that much, but we're not all children of God. Christ looked at those Pharisees and said, you are of your father, the devil. Everyone is created by God, but only those who trust the gospel, are his children. And so you're given a new identity. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You know there are only two people in this world, only two people who have a right and a privilege to look at me and call me dad. Only two. A lot of people call me a lot of different things. But only two have a right to call me dad. When you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on Calvary's cross, his resurrection, friend, you're given the right and you're given the privilege to go to God and call him your Abba Father, your daddy, a new identity. Thirdly, you get a new relationship. Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, talking about his righteousness. And so we're baptized into Christ as we're baptized by the Spirit of God. When you're saved by faith, you're baptized into Christ. You remember when you were physically baptized, perhaps many of you in this baptistry here, you were plunged into that water and it engulfed you. And uh, in a sense, you were clothed with that water. When you are baptized into Christ, you are clothed with His righteousness. And that word means to, to put on a costume because... Uh, you're going to, to, to play a role on a stage. Coming to Christ is getting a whole new wardrobe, my friend. It's getting a whole new set of clothing. You exchange the tattered rags of your old sinful life and uh, you get the beautiful robes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
And the old life is, is gone forever. Out with the old addictions. Out with the lies. Out with the wrong friendships and relationships. Out with the racial prejudice. Out with the anger. Out with the lust. And what does a well, well-dressed Christian wear? He wears the character of Christ. And when people look at you, they ought to look at Christ. And those that knew you prior to this, they ought to look at you and say, what happened to you? You're not the same. And you ought to be able to tell them, you know what, I'm a new person. Jesus Christ has changed my life. Of course, that change is instantaneous. And it's gradual at the same time. You're given a new wardrobe the very moment you're saved. But if you're like me, you just want to hang on to that old one a little longer. And that's not good, but it just happens. We're so used to the dirty, smelly rags of sin that it's hard to give them up. But we have to because coming to Christ is like joining a new team. It's like putting on a new jersey. What, ha- what would happen? Suppose a member of, uh, of uh, the, the Texas Rangers joined the Astros, traded to the Astros, and he showed up at Minute Maid Stadium with his Rangers jersey on. His new teammates wouldn't be too happy. they say, change your uniform or head back to Arlington. And they should. Once you join a new team, your allegiance changes. Your outfit changes. Your uniform changes. Coming to Christ is like that. You've joined His team, and now you wear His uniform, which is His righteousness, His character. You get a, uh, you get a new righteousness. You get a new relationship. Fourthly, you get a new standing. Notice in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Do you know what a Jewish man's first prayer was in that day? He would say something like this, God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. I thank you that I'm free and I'm not a slave, that I'm a man and not a woman. That's what they would pray. But Paul is saying here, it's another amazing promise to the children of God, that in Christ all of those barriers that separate us are tore down. They're gone. Outward distinctions have no no barriers whatsoever when it comes to salvation. For instance, there are no divisions in the body of Christ on the basis of race, on the basis of uh, ethnic origin, on skin color, or on national origin. You can be a Jew. You can be a Greek. uh, You can be an Englishman. You can be an Egyptian. You can be a Russian. You can be a Chilean. You can be a Filipino. You can be a Nigerian. Whatever. It doesn't matter to God at all. For in God doesn't favor one race or one ethnic group over another. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. The same thing is true regarding social classes. Slaves and free walk hand in hand in the family of God. That would have been an astounding thought in the first century, the Christian church, but it's true. We're all saved on the same basis, and that is by grace through faith. Sexual distinction doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. Men and women are saved the same way. They have equal standing, equal value in the eyes of God. That means that a Gentile slave woman would have exactly the same rights in the eyes of God as a Jewish free man. The ground is level at the cross. In Christ, we are all one. God doesn't play favorites. And if God doesn't play favorites, my friend, you and I shouldn't. You and I shouldn't. You get a new standing. Fifthly, and I'm done, you get a new future. Verse 29, he says, And if ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. An heir is a family, a family member by law. They, they're, they're a member of a particular family. If you are an heir in a family, you have a legal right to an inheritance. Since now we are members of God's family, we have rights to all that's been promised to his children. He promises forgiveness justification, freedom, an abundant life, joy, peace, power, redemption. The list is, uh, we could go on for hours. And friend, that's just for this life. It gets better. When you die, you not only get all of that, friend, but you go to heaven forever. Forever. And the world has no answer for the problem of sin or the problem of death. In Christ, though, we've been delivered. And if you know Jesus, death is a doorway only to the presence of God. It's not the end, it's only the beginning. And friend, these things are true for every believer everywhere at all times because they are unconditional promises. They don't depend on performance. In light of this, Paul is writing and he says basically, why would you want to go back to the old way of life? 
Why would you want to go back to the chains of legalism? Why would you want to go back to the rule keeping as a means of pleasing God? It just doesn't make sense. And friend, everything that God has for us is wrapped up in His Son and we receive His Son by faith when we reach out and we trust Him as Lord and Savior. And all of these promises are free for the taking to those that would come to Christ. I saw a bumper sticker a while back and uh, said Jesus in big block, all capital letters. And underneath were these words that says, and that's my final answer. thought that was pretty good. When Jesus is your final answer, I'll tell you, God gives you so much that is new. So much. And I like new, don't you? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you know Christ is Lord and Savior? If not, you don't have this freedom. You don't have this identity. You don't have this relationship. You don't have that standing. You don't have that future. Friend, all that you have is, is temporary pleasure, rags of sin, and eternity spent in hell. Eternal damnation, torment away from God. But it just doesn't have to be that way, my friend. You can come and give your heart to Christ. Trust in Him and Him alone for salvation. Say an everlasting yes to the gospel. And He'll save your soul. And all that we discuss this afternoon will be yours in the person of Christ. Father, bless this invitation. Have your will. Have your way. Save that one that's lost under the sound of my voice. Strengthen the church. May we be encouraged. Lord, when we think about how good salvation truly is. Amen. You got a number there.